Aloha and welcome to Books, 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 a talk show on books that we think you should know about. I'm your host, Mihaila Stoops, and today's book is The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth by Sam Quinones. My guest today is Ken Shaw. He's a 36 years law enforcement veteran who spent most of his career in drug enforcement and drug policy. Currently, Kent is the executive director for Western States Information Network, an entity that supports law enforcement agencies in the states of California, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, and Hawaii. And prior to this um, appointment, Kent was the chief uh, for California Drug, I'm sorry, California Department of Justice, Bureau of Narcotics in, uh, Enforcement, and Bureau of Investigation. Kent, thank you so much for joining me today and for recommending such a good book. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Well, let's just dive into it. First, let's start this discussion with the first question, and that is why the author calls it a opioid epidemic. Yeah, I think it's just really because of the, the sheer scope of, of the issue uh, as it uh, grew. And again, Sam addresses this issue uh, really in his first book, which was uh, Dreamland, which addressed specifically the opioid epidemic issue. Uh, really the diversion of legitimate legal pharmaceutical drugs that were being diverted uh, into the black market. And uh, he touches upon that in this book and in a number of different places, which I think is important to do so, because obviously that is largely has, has given the segue uh, to the issue that we're now experiencing with the synthetic drugs and fentanyl and methamphetamine. And so uh, there also has been some developments in the courts uh, after the the post-production of, uh, of Dreamland in terms of addressing some of the internal communications which were obtained through a lot of those uh, prosecutorial efforts and the settlements that took place. They actually see those internal communications and confirm that more or less that these companies were in fact profiting off the misery of this issue uh, as these drugs were being uh, over-prescribed and, and flowing into the black market and uh, resulting in, in just horrific outcomes in terms of addiction and, and death. So I, I got quite an education on drugs, I have to say. Um, I've learned that we basically have moved from drugs that were produced from plants to synthetic drugs and designer drugs that are produced in labs from chemicals. And the author states that just in 2020 alone, 17 new designer drugs or synthetic drugs were identified. I can only assume that there's been even more since then, and they come with their specific challenges and sets of issues. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, these organizations are, are brilliant business people, right? And they're always figuring out the way to uh, build a better mousetrap and, uh, and to increase their profits. And so the reality is, is that a lot of the, you know, particularly early in my career in terms of drug enforcement, we were dealing with these, what you could refer to as plant-based uh, products. I mean, cocaine comes from the coca plant and, uh, you know, heroin coming from the, uh, the poppy and, uh, and also marijuana, obviously you know, being grown. And so, uh, but we long, particularly here in California, dealt with methamphetamine, which of course is a synthetic drug. Uh, but I think these organizations have, you know, learned that, you know, rather being relegated to dealing with growing, which was uh, vulnerable to a lot of, you know, attack by uh, law enforcement and your seasonal issues and, and things of that nature. If you go to synthetic where you can manufacture it in a, in a warehouse somewhere, you have a virtually unlimited uh, production capabilities on a year round basis. And so that's really where we see this segue going from uh, as the people were really addicted to products that were coming from plant-based uh, to these synthetic products, which have then taken their place. And then, of course, you know, I, I, methamphetamine, they, they talk about a resurgence of it. It never really went away, but it's really kind of a whole new product in terms of what's taking place now. And the production that used to historically take place in the United States and uh, California and places like Super Labs were 
it was being manufactured by hundreds of pounds and other places in the in the Midwest where they, they were using smaller, like what they call shake and bake, small amounts. Um, but nonetheless, that was happening here. And then that shifted back down to Mexico. And so that's really, um, you know, what we're confronting these days. So fentanyl was discovered in the 70s in Belgium. And then China started producing it in, you know, mass quantities. Um, in 2019, fentanyl was, um, it, I mean, China uh, outlawed it. So now it's not okay to produce fentanyl in China, but they produce other substances similar to it. Um, they cannot ship it to US, they send it to Mexico. So Mexico is again, the preferred route of drug traffickers. So we have two culprits so far. We have China, we have Mexico, but we also have the US demand for this, for, for these drugs and also a supply that is always available and always enticing. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of those uh, connections, the, the international ones really were already established. Even if you go back to when uh, a way of manufacturing methamphetamine you know, more than a decade ago, which was the ephedrine reduction process, which used pseudoephedrine or ephedrine, pure ephedrine, uh, a lot of those chemicals were being uh, imported into Mexico via not only China, but India and Germany. So, you know, the Mexican cartels had long reached out and established those relationships in other places throughout Europe in Asia to access the, uh, the, the basic precursors and chemicals that they needed. Of course, the, you know, the, the most prominent route for smuggling those drugs once they're manufactured is coming out of Mexico into the Southwest border. And so as they moved and, uh, took the manufacturing, for example, of uh, methamphetamine and brought that back down into Mexico. Um, that was a shift there. And then they also increased all that production capability for the fentanyl now to come in and seize upon uh, the growing opioid epidemic that existed. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a perfect storm for them to be able to seize that opportunity and uh, for their product producing now. And, you know, it's a matter also of marketing these substances. Most recently, uh, we saw on the news that you have uh, fentanyl uh, pills that look like Smarties, like candy, which, you know, some could take by mistake, for instance. So, and um, there's also a matter of, like, once the drugs are in U.S., there's stories in the book of kids that order these um pills online on Snapchat because the messages disappear quickly and nobody could track those, or at least the parents can't. And the pills get delivered at the kid's house at 3 a.m. Yeah, sad but true, but yes. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier, in terms of there being brilliant uh, business folks, uh, marketing is a big component of that. And, you know, the pills that, uh, that they smuggle into this country here will look uh, virtually identical to pharmaceutical grade pills. They'll make them look like Xanax or uh, Oxycontin pills or any of the other ones with the same markings on them from the manufacturers here in the United States with the certain numbers on them, uh, the coloring that they do because they use pill presses down there to manufacture these. And of course, these pills don't have any of the legitimate substance in them that they purport to. They're, they're you know, full of fentanyl and other binders and things of that nature. But as you mentioned, uh, they we see this uh, at different times. We've seen it also with methamphetamine when it was was colored. Uh, and I don't know if that was popularized because of the movie Breaking Bad, that, where you know the the lead manufacturer on that show, you know, his signature was was blue methamphetamine. There's times that they'll manufacture that, uh, and so with these pills, we saw this big wave of these kind of rainbow colors and and things that they know will be more attractive. And, uh, and yeah, and unfortunately, these folks can readily go on to social media sites and, uh, and order it just like they're going to, uh, to their favorite fast food restaurant and looking at a, at a menu and seeing all the wonderful, colorful things that they'd be able to order. And of course, they have no idea uh, what is going to be delivered to them and they're going to consume. And that's really the, the issue is, you know, when Sam touches upon it in the book where he said that he spoke with folks that had been you know, heroin addicts for decades. And I certainly encountered a lot of those folks in my career, uh, but they were able to, to, to maintain what they did. You know, they had to get up and, 
and get well in the morning to avoid uh, withdrawals. But, you know, by and large, that are able to function, they, they knew how to, to get along. But uh, when fentanyl comes along, a lot of those long uh, chronic users uh, were dying very quickly. I'm some literally within the first couple of uses of the drug. And so uh, it's to the point now where, and as the uh, the DEA has their uh, their kind of slogan that they have out now, you know, one pill can kill. And that's the truth. And some of these people aren't chronic users. They may have only used for, for the first time. And that may be all it takes, particularly when they're, you know, naive um, levels to uh, deal with addiction. So what's a parent supposed to do? I'm a parent of a teenager. And what am I supposed to do to prepare my daughter, you know, to warn her about this? Yeah, I mean, education is is critical to, to actually have these discussions to let them know, um, you know, what they're confronting, you know, that the, the sheer danger of these things and the fact that that uh, although these things may look like legitimate pharmaceutical drugs, um, there is no telling, you know, what they are. They probably contain some deadly, you know, level of substance. And uh, and there's no consistency in terms of, you know, one pill to the next. You could have two pills sitting next to each other, look identical, uh, but they could be very different. And to, again, uh, people who are naive opioid users, uh, these things are extremely dangerous. And also when you used in conjunction with other things like alcohol and other substances that just kind of explain uh, exponentially, it's that they, they increase dramatically the effects that you have uh, from one substance, but being in, put in combination with others. And so really, yeah. that's, that's a big part of it, because if you look at that three legged stool, you know, prevention is, is absolutely critical, Avoid, keeping people from first, you know, ever becoming in the grips of addiction. But in this case, from perhaps using for the first time and then never living to see another day. One of the interesting things that I um, read in this book is among many, but there's quite a bit of research or information on neuroscience and addiction. And um, I've learned that 30% of us are genetically inclined to uh, be addicted to something. It could be a substance or it could be a type of feeling or emotion. And that once one is dependent on one substance, he or she is primed to be depend to become dependent on another substance. So it's it seems like one thing is going to lead to another. And I'm surprised that the author doesn't talk much about marijuana in this book, and I wonder why. Yeah, no, and you're absolutely right. I mean, if you think about it, just just think of alcohol. That uh, you know, somebody who's under the influence of alcohol, it lowers your inhibitions. You're far more likely, and people probably have those unfortunate stories of goofy things they did when they were intoxicated on alcohol they wouldn't have done otherwise. And so these drugs uh, all do the same thing. They lower your ability to to reason. You know, that part of your brain, the cerebral cortex, the the decision making parts of your brain. And these other drugs, in particular, we're talking about fentanyl and then the methamphetamine. You know, they rewire your your reward pathways and they change the way that you think. And, you know, Sam talked about it in here that, you know, folks actually lose their memory, their ability sometimes to communicate. It completely changes that. And that that brain chemistry takes long, long periods of times to try and overcome that for those folks to come back to some, you know, reasonable level. Uh, Sam touched a little bit on marijuana in here. Um, in terms of kind of the cautionary tale of the legalization aspect or the decriminalization. And we've seen this, you know, first marijuana being uh, legalized for the purposes, medicinal purposes. And then now we see this spreading trend for uh, recreational purposes. And I think that is shown kind of as a bellwether because, you know, we, we all warned, of course, those who tried to pass the, those uh, laws or initiatives, you know, told everybody that this would be the, the silver bullet, bullet that would end gangs being involved in marijuana and the cartels would no longer be involved. And this would, and of course, <laughs> nothing but. The opposite has, has come to, to be is that the black market is flourishing now, perhaps even more so than it was before in the marijuana industry. And uh, and more young people seek treatment for the addiction to marijuana than they do any other substance, controlled substance. And so, you know, the issue being is that, you know, we the two biggest killers are, are legal substances, tobacco and alcohol. And so if you have something that is more readily available, uh, it is going to be a bigger problem. And that's just the reality of it. And we're seeing that happen even in, in the marijuana industry now. And so, uh, you know, he touches briefly upon that when he 
addresses those issues. But um, I know that the focus of this book specifically for him was was the synthetic aspect of you know the fentanyl and the methamphetamine in terms of how that is having its profound impact on on uh, really our society and how we you know wove it into exp- in the explanation for the the growing homeless issue that we have with these tent cities all over and how it's correlated. Yeah, that was a very interesting approach in the book, the correlation between uh, drug abuse and homelessness. And also what was even more interesting to me, the correlation between um, the uh, police number of police shootings and the use of P2P meth, which is a substance that makes people paranoid, act erratically, uncontrollable. Um, I, you know, haven't heard of this um, kind of ideas before where there's a correlation between the two. And I wonder, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, there, there's often a discussion of the, you know, it's kind of the chicken and the egg argument. Uh, people look to these the vast homeless issues that we have that really have been, you know, dramatically increasing. Uh, and not only just in the major metropolitan areas, but other parts around the country. And then the issue, people say, well, you know, of course, you know, housing uh, costs are too exorbitant. That's driving people into homelessness. It is a legitimate issue. But they also uh, say, you know, we don't have the mental health services. And I think that's legitimate as well. But the reality is, is that a lot of the folks, and as Sam pointed out, and both folks that he interviewed, including, you know, some of the research that he did, and certainly been my experience, that a lot of these folks are not people who have mental health issues before. It's, it's psychosis and issues that are being generated from their drug abuse, yes, abuse. And they've even found that these people, once they get off it and they get into long-term treatment or long-term recovery, and they haven't used for some period of time, that all of those symptoms that they had before go away. So unfortunately, the issue that we're experiencing a lot of this stuff are folks that it's really kind of a drug-driven issue, really more so than anything else. There's kind of those two distinct populations that uh, I think it was the mayor of Aurora, Colorado, who went out and did an experiment. He was a he went out and posed as a, um, a homeless veteran. He, he was, in fact, a veteran, but he wasn't homeless. And he found that uh, the population was divided between two areas. One it was those in the shelter, those people who voluntarily went there, who, who there's rules that are there you have to follow in terms of curfew, no drug use, don't commit crimes. He said he felt extremely safe. He didn't ever saw any violence. Uh, he felt very comfortable in those locations. And then he went to the tent cities and it was completely the opposite. It was violence. Uh, it was rampant drug use. Uh, he had stuff stolen from him. He said he felt scared to death the whole time he was there. And he discovered that the populations never talked to each other. He never found anybody in a shelter who had ever been in a tent city and nobody in a tent city had been there. And the issue is they try and find these solutions that's like a one fit all. And these are dis- distinct different issues than people who maybe you know have lost their job and are trying to get back on their feet and are going to a shelter versus somebody who's living intentionally in a in a tent city and has no interest of of ever getting out of that. And it seems that recovery is quite challenging, and just sending people to um, traditional jail may not be enough. That they actually need more support, and there's some. Um, places that have experimented with that by having a special jail where the inmates get um, activities and classes and they're taught all over again. Um, So at the end of the day, as Sam points out, it is the community that is going to fix this. And um, some of our viewers may ask, why is this called, why is this book called The Least of Us? Well, the impressive part, and I recommend our viewers to at least read the one chapter before last, which is titled The Least of Us. And um, the wording actually comes from the Bible, from Matthew, where Jesus is quoted as saying, in as much as you have done it onto one of uh, the least of these, my brethren, you've done it onto me. So the idea is that, you know, we, the community, can um, help solve this crisis. And these people are victims in our community, and we're going to have to deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you touched on a, on a great topic. And, uh, you know, so I, I served on an alcohol and drug advisory board in a, in a county here in, in California. And, and all my f- colleagues that were on that board were substance abuse treatment folks. And it, it, 
as is the case oftentimes, they were all in long-term recovery. They, they make the best folks, right? They've been there, they've done it, uh, and they, they're terrific at the job that they do. Uh, but when some of these propositions were being passed to uh, decriminalize the personal use quantities of some of these uh, controlled substances, uh, they were they're very supportive of it. And I cautioned them. I said, look, you know, if you think about it, how, how are most of the people uh, coming to your facilities being referred there? They're not they're not voluntarily going there. The people who are in the grips of addiction and trying to hit the bottom, they're being referred there because of the criminal justice system. The vast majority of them. And I said, when that goes away, you, you, you won't have people coming to your facility. And that is, in fact, what ended up happening. And so, and Sam touches on it. I, I never spent my career trying to put drug users in jail. I, I went after traffickers and dealers and people who were involved in violent crimes. Uh, and, and jail isn't necessarily the place just for somebody who's using. Of course, they're committing a host of other crimes when they're under the influence and sometimes violent ones. But the, the jail facilities are doing a better job and more needs to be done in terms of providing uh, services to support them and even wraparound services to give them, you know, so they can have a license when they get out and some basic job skills and things of that nature. But treatment is a is a, an important component of this whole thing. And we have a saying in law enforcement where we deal with some of these very unexplicable problems. We say, you know, we're not going to arrest our way out of this. Well, guess what? Sam has said in the book, we're not going to treat our way out of this issue either. It's going to take a holistic approach in these communities to address these issues from all these prongs. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a three-legged prong or stool. It's prevention, it's treatment, and it's enforcement. And if you take any one of those away, it's a recipe for disaster. And so drug courts have been very successful in terms of people committing crimes. They can hold that over their head. There needs to be some level of accountability to get those folks into treatment because it doesn't work the first time, the second, third, or sometimes even the fourth or fifth. But uh, they need to have that accountability and somebody to force them into that area so those folks can separate uh, their brain from the drugs and get into some level of commitment or retreatment away from that issue and to start recovery. And and it's going to take uh, really looking at this issue from, from all three of those perspectives. And as the data shows, you know, we cannot wait until these addicts hit rock bottom because with fentanyl around us, that rock bottom may be death. So... Oh. Uh, again, uh, we need to do everything we can as early as possible, including prevention and education. So I I want to thank you again for joining me today and for recommending this book. It, it is a tremendous read, and I wholeheartedly recommend it to all our viewers. It's going to be an education in many perspectives. So thank you again, Kent, for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Glad to share uh, what, what I have to share. Wonderful. Well, um, until next time, to our viewers, um, read as many books as you can and learn as many things as you can. Ahoy ho! Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.